Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we're very happy to welcome you to the International Peace Institute, whether you're joining us today in person or online. My name is Jenna Russo, and I'm the Director of Research here at IPI, and I'm also the head of our Brian Urquhart Center for Peace Operations. We're very pleased to have you here today, along with our excellent panel of speakers, to discuss and launch the new report on forced marriage by non-state armed groups, frequency, forms, and impact. The report authors, Dr. Phoebe Donnelly and Emily Myers, are with us today to discuss the findings, as is our panel of speakers who will be able to comment on the findings and recommendations. In many ways, it is appropriate that we would be discussing this topic right now, as the UN Sixth Committee has been debating a new convention on crimes against humanity, and with the recent passing of Ben Ferenc, who spent his life advocating for justice and accountability for those whose lives were affected by wartime violence. The topic we will discuss today is forced marriage by non-state armed groups, which is a distinct form of conflict-related sexual violence. The report introduces a new data set on the frequency and forms of forced marriage, and it, along with the report's uh, policy recommendations, is an important tool for policymakers for both prevention and addressing its impact. And I should point out that we do have the report now hot off the press in print, available, I believe, out in the lobby area and also on IPI's website. We're looking forward to a very rich discussion today, and in a moment, I'll return it over to the report authors to provide an overview of their findings, and then we'll hear from each of our panelists before opening the floor for questions and comments. We will be able to take interventions from both our in-person and online participants, so I encourage you to think of your questions as the panelists are speaking. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge our partners in today's event. Special thanks to the Folk Bernadotte Academy for supporting the research that went into the report and to UN Women who is our partner for today's event. So Phoebe and Emily, I'd like to first turn to you to present the report. And by way of introductions, Dr. Phoebe Donnelly, sitting here to my right is a senior research fellow at IPI and head of IPI's Women, Peace and Security Program. She is also an adjunct assistant professor at the School of International and Public Affairs at Columbia University and a visiting fellow at the Feinstein International Center. And Emily Myers, who's joining us online today, is a PhD candidate in political science at Duke University and a National Science Foundation graduate research fellow. Emily's research explores the, the strategies that armed groups use to build social ties to civilians during civil war with a particular focus on the gender dimension of rebel civilian ties. So Emily, I believe we're, we're turning over to you first to present findings. Yeah, thank you so much, Jenna, for that introduction. Um, so as Jenna mentioned, our original data set provides insights into the prevalence and patterns of forced marriage by non-state armed groups and its types, um, and it introduces and draws findings from this data set. Forced marriage by armed groups has been observed and documented in certain cases, but until now, we didn't have a framework for understanding the forms it can take, and we also didn't have any quantitative cross-national data on its occurrence. And we felt that these were important gaps to fill as policymakers, academics, and practitioners increasingly recognize the value of disaggregating forms of conflict-related sexual violence. So providing a definition of forced marriage by non-state armed groups as a distinct form of CRSV and introducing this quantitative data set documenting its prevalence are among the main contributions of our report. We define forced marriages by non-state armed groups as relationships that are facilitated or enforced by non-state armed groups, are referred to as marriages, involve some sort of marital ceremony, or result in the parties being called spouses, and are conducted without the complete and free consent of one or both parties. As we were gathering data on this phenomenon, we were struck by how different forced marriage by non-state armed groups could look across contexts and groups. We found that it could vary in who it targets, how it's perpetrated, and how institutionalized it is. And so to help us understand this variation, we conceptualized three distinct types of forced marriage. Phoebe will go into these types um, in more detail, but just so you have uh, 
a bit of a sense of what they are. Um, member member forced marriage occurs between armed group combatants or officials. Member civilian forced marriage is between an armed group member and a civilian. And civilian civilian forced marriage is between civilians who are living under armed group authority. So now I'll share my screen and present some of the top line findings from our data set. We collect data on 432 non-state armed groups that were active in armed conflicts between 1946 and 2021. We find that 72 of these groups, or about 17%, used forced marriage at some point while they were engaged in armed conflict. And this suggests that forced marriage is used by almost as many armed groups as perpetrate wartime rape which according to the repertoires of sexual violence and armed conflict data set has been used by about 18.5% of non-state armed groups during conflict. And like with most forms of CRSV, forced marriage is likely underreported. So we think that this should be interpreted as a lower bound of the prevalence of forced marriage. Importantly, our data set provides a binary indicator of whether non-state armed groups perpetrated forced marriage, so did they or did they not, um, and it doesn't provide estimates of how frequently they did so, but we found evidence that in all but three cases, these armed groups were using forced marriage either as a frequent practice or they were using it by policy. Member member forced marriage, or sorry, excuse me, member civilian forced marriage was by far the most common type of forced marriage perpetrated by armed groups. Of the 72 groups that perpetrated forced marriage, 78% were using member civilian forced marriage, while 19% used member member forced marriage and 7% used civilian civilian forced marriage. And we don't view these types as mutually exclusive. Um, we found three groups that were using both member member and member civilian. We also found that forced marriage was not confined to a specific geographic region or a specific type of armed group. So on the left, um, countries that are in light purple are countries which saw an armed group active at some point in our data. Um, and the dark purple are of those countries that had an active armed group, um, places where that one of those armed groups used forced marriage. So as you can see, while we find the most cases in Africa and Asia, it's really prevalent across all regions. So where there are armed groups active, there's likely at least one group that's using this practice. Um, and we found something similar with armed group ideology. So on your right, um, the dark purple is the total number of groups that had these broad groups of ideologies, um, and the light purple is the share of those groups that were using forced marriage. So it is not a phenomenon of religious armed groups or leftist armed groups. Um, it, it, it can happen by, by any armed group. Um, and we think that the data set that we introduce in this report and the conceptualization of these different types of forced marriage can be a really important tool um, to respond to and address forced marriage. Uh, so I'll turn it over to Phoebe now. Thank you so much, Emily. And thank you to Jenna and the fellow panelists and everyone who's tuning in and in person here today. So as Emily mentioned, we came up with three different forms of forced marriage. And this is because as we are going through the data, we realized how different forced marriage can look across contexts. And that therefore these forms will have different impacts on survivors and communities and require tailored policy responses. So I'm going to discuss the forms in more detail and provide examples and describe some of the impacts they have on survivors. And I want to flag that this is not to create, uh, as we say in the women, peace and security field, a hierarchy of harm. No form is more harmful than the other, but more to show some distinctions in the range of experiences and impacts. After discussing the three forms of forced marriage, I'll conclude by discussing some of our policy recommendations. So as Emily mentioned, the first form of forced marriage is member-member forced marriage. And this is when non-state armed group leaders force lower ranking members into marriage with one another. And this type of forced marriage inserts a non-state armed group into pr the combatants' private lives 
and ensures their commitment to the movement. An example we cite in the paper is the Communist Party of Nepal, Maoist, or just the Maoist, and they encouraged revolutionary marriages. And while many of these marriages were in fact voluntary, where the partners wanted to marry and were seeking permission from the group, in other cases, marriages were forced. And these forced marriages often occurred when Maoist leaders forced unmarried female recruits to marry another group member. These marriages often disrupt norms around marriage. For example, the member-member marriages perpetrated by the Maoist were intercaste, and so they resulted in economic and social discrimination for ex-combatants. The second form, and as Emily flagged, the most common form, is member-civilian forced marriage. And this can be linked to abduction, although it's not always. And I think that's a flag we highlight in the report. So one case study we detail in the report is the Lord's Resistance Army in Northern Uganda, or the LRA. But we have two distinct panelists who will be highlighting that case. So I'm not gonna talk too much about that one, but definitely refer to the report if you're interested. Another example we cite in the report is Al-Shabaab in Somalia. And this is an interesting case because it's a different form of force than abduction. So Al-Shabaab used its power over communities it's governed to force families to marry their daughters to Al-Shabaab fighters. Member civilian forced marriage have economic, social, and health impacts on survivors and on their children. One longitudinal study that Teddy Yatim, one of our panelists worked on, found that households in Northern Uganda, this is decades after the conflict, that had a member who had experienced sexual violence, of which forced marriage was the most common form in Northern Uganda, were more vulnerable to crime and faced higher economic and food insecurity than other households. So that really long lasting impact. The final form of forced marriage is civilian-civilian forced marriage, and this is less common but still important. This form of forced marriage is often used by non-state armed groups to tighten their social control over civilian populations and to engineer a certain type of population. For example, the Mahdi army in Iraq forced Christian families living in its territory who could not pay taxes to the group to marry their daughters to Muslim men in the community. So next I'm gonna talk about our recommendations. And in the report, we highlight some of the mechanisms that are currently in place to understand and respond to forced marriage. And our recommendations really build off that and think about how we can strengthen certain mechanisms. The first category of recommendations is around data collection. And we recommend improving data collection on forced marriage and being more specific and identifying when forced marriage is occurring. So we discuss in the report the ways in which conflict-related sexual violence or CRSV is often grouped together despite coming up with, despite several forms of conflict-related sexual violence being a component of this. And so we think it's really important to disaggregate when possible. Specifically, we often see forced marriage and sexual slavery lumped together, and we, we see these as different forms of violence with different impacts. It will also be beneficial for research to continue to identify the specific needs of survivors of forced marriage. The second group of recommendations is around prosecution, and forced marriage should continue to be prosecuted as a distinct crime against humanity in international criminal courts. And as Jenna mentioned, forced marriage should be a distinct crime against humanity on the Treaty on Crimes Against Humanity at the UN General Assembly. The third category of recommendations is around UN sanctions. And the panel of experts for UN sanctions committee should continue to include information on CRSV in the reports and when possible, identify when forced marriage is being perpetrated. Additionally, UN Security Council's sanction committees should continue to include CRSV and sanctions listing criteria and ensure that the listing criteria are applied against perpetrators of forced marriage. Finally, every panel of experts should include at least one member at the bare minimum with expertise in gender issues and or CRSV. Finally, our recommendations for expert designing and implementing reintegration, reintegration programs are that they should factor in how forced marriage creates diverse links to a non-state armed groups, 
and how these links can result in specific needs for those exiting the group. For example, some women in forced marriages will want assistance in engaging in formal divorce processes. Others will not and will want to legalize these marriages. Some women may need assistance in obtaining death certificates. So there's a variety of needs that survivors of forced marriage may face during reintegration. So I'll stop here and I'm happy to answer any additional questions and I encourage you to review the report. Thank you. Thank you so much to Phoebe and Emily for that overview. And next, I am delighted to turn to our panelists. Um, I will say that each of our panelists has extensive experience and biographies, but for the sake of time today, I'm just going to read a portion of each speaker's biography. So first, I would like to turn to Teddy Atim, who is joining us today online. Teddy is a visiting fellow at the Feinstein International Center with more than 15 years of experience as a practitioner and researcher in humanitarian emergencies and post-conflict settings. She has a particular focus on Uganda, examining how violence and armed conflict affects populations. So Teddy, turning to you and drawing on your extensive research experience, can you tell us a bit more about how forced marriage affects local communities, both during and after conflict? Thank you. Thank you, everyone in the room and for those who are following us online. Um, I think I want to start by saying, like Phoebe already mentioned, we have done, you know, way lots of representative studies, population based studies in, in the conflict affected region of northern Uganda. And, and among the things we found was uh, that in the two sub regions that were heavily affected, we, we see that one in 50 households in one of the households, and, and another one, two in 25 households, I mean, one in 25 households, meaning one in 25 households will, will have, you know, will be reporting a case of sexual violence in, in, during the time of the conflict. But of course, the, the interesting part is the fact that of, of this, approximately 3,000, we find approximately 3,000 to 8,000 households reporting having a child bond of war or a child bond of forced marriage in the time during the time of the conflict. And these figures, of course, are significantly underreported. But what is much more important for our discussion is today is to understand the impact of this. What we do see from our statistic is that these women who report experiencing sexual violation during the time of the conflict were more likely to experience ongoing violations in the return community. This is because the experience of sexual violence during it seems to set them up to experience more violations in their vocabulary, disappearance of other family members, um, serious physical harm to their children, theft, land grabbing, physical attack, poisoning, and also rape. So in a way, what we do see is that the point is that there's a multiplier effect of, 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 of forced marriage on the survivors. So even when they're back to their communities, we see ongoing violations on their lives on a day-to-day -day basis. And one of the things we have noted is the increased stigma or something, of course, a lot of us already know about, that they tend to suffer more stigma in the return communities. Uh, and in a key example of how we have actually studied and learned the, the, the you know, the, the situation of stigma among survivors of forced marriage had to do with uh, their inability to, to form you know, stable marital relationships on return. A lot of the women that I've spoken to either were marrying their former captors, again, looking going back to what Phoebe mentioned, they, they, they created relationships with their former captors because a lot of them said this were much safer and they know them. And you know they, they share similar experiences, and so they were more accepting and less likely to stig stigmatize them. But those ones who are cohabit, who are living with other men who are not work affected, were more likely to be cohabiting, but also more likely to be in very abusive relationships. And and yet, for a lot of women, these marriages are very important in terms of enabling them to regain their social honor and respect but also safeguard the future of their children. So a lot of times women were trying to form marital relationships, but this was really not happening. So many women um, were, were unable to do that. And, 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 and what, one of the things we, we learned is that um, for mothers, 
who returned with children, a lot of their children were seen as a threat. This, and they returned with these children in their communities. They found it much, much harder to remarry. And, and the ones, especially with boy children, and once they remarried, also they, they were more likely to, to face more resistance from those families who saw their children as a threat to their land inheritance. But even in their own families, these children are their maternal families. And a lot of times, if women tried to, you know, to go on with the marriage, they, they or to just move out of those relationships or out of those families. Teddy, we seem to have lost your connection a bit. So I think if it's okay, maybe we'll pause on Teddy's intervention and see if we can get you back connected again. And maybe if you want, you can also try turning off the camera to see if the audio works better in that way. But if it's okay, Teddy, we'll pause on your intervention and, and thank you so much for pointing out too. I think probably a lot of us have, have thought about the stigma that women face, um, but, but really interesting to think about the multiplier effect of other forms um, of violence and hardship that not only they face, but also their children are facing in the aftermath of this. So I'd like to turn next to Pauline Brosh. Um, Pauline is a policy analyst at UN Women, where she covers issues related to protection, including CRSV. Before joining UN Women, she worked with the UN peacekeeping mission in the Central African Republic, MINUSCA, and the Office of the SRSG on Sexual Violence and Conflict. So Pauline, now bringing in a policy perspective, what can be done within the UN community to better address forced marriage and other forms of CRSV? Thank you, Jenna. Um, before responding to your question, just wanted to say thank you to IPI for organizing this very important event. And we as UN Women are honored to co-host this event together with you. And I would also congratulate you, Phoebe and Emily, to this excellent report, which I think is a very important contribution to uh, discussions around forced marriage. Um, yeah, so to your, to your question um, about what, uh, yeah, what can be done at the UN level to better address forced marriage and other forms of CRSV. Um, I would like to touch on three things. Um, the first one is on is documentation and reporting. And um, Phoebe, you mentioned data collection as one of the key recommendations. And when we look at the UN uh, and uh, UN reporting and documentation, uh, we really need to make sure that all UN reporting mechanisms adequately document forced marriage and other forms of sexual violence and conflict. The report highlights the monitoring analysis reporting and reporting arrangements, the MARA, and the reports of sanctions monitoring mechanisms. And I would like to add here a third documentation mechanism, which is the human rights investigations mandated by the Human Rights Council, such as fact-finding missions and commissions of inquiry. For example, the dedicated report on CSV published in 2022 by the Commission on Human Rights in South Sudan documents several accounts of forced marriage and includes a recommendation specifically addressing forced and early marriage. The dedicated report on SGBV published in 2018 by the Independent International Commission of Inquiry in Syria dedicated an entire section on forced marriage and also included an analysis of the impact of forced marriage on survivors. Reports of human rights investigations inform discussions at the Security Council, including through the informal expert group on women, peace and security, and they also feed into reports of the Secretary General, for example, the report on conflict related sexual violence. UN Women, in partnership with OHEHR and Justice Rapid Response, deploy specialized SGBV experts, including investigators and interpreters, to many of these mechanisms to ensure that SGBV and other dimensions of human rights violations are adequately reflected in these reports. And my second point um, is on reparations. 
while the responsibility to provide reparations for human rights violations is with states, other actors, including the UN, have an important role to play in supporting the design and implementation of reparations programs and in ensuring that these programs are truly survivor-centered. For example, in Kosovo, UN Women supported the Office of the President to organize consultations with survivors to create a safe and empowering space for them to express their concerns and priorities around the establishment of a reparations commission for CSV survivors. During the consultation process, survivors stated that they have few economic opportunities, but that they wanted to work and to earn money. With the understanding that it could take years for the reparations process to become operational and to begin to address the survivors' economic needs, UN Women partnered with four victims' associations across Kosovo to provide microeconomic grants to survivors. The project boosted their self-confidence and encouraged them to apply, to apply for the official reparations program. The microgrants also gave the survivors a place to invest the reparations funds they received and the financial literacy skills to do so, and so that they could use their reparations benefits sustainably. This project demonstrates how development programs can complement reparation programs and enhance their sustainability and their transformative effect. In this example here, although it was the duty of Kosovo to provide reparations, UN Women used a development-focused programming to create an enabling environment for survivors um, to claim their right, uh, their right and their reparations. And then my last point um, for this one, I would like to zoom out a little bit and highlight the importance of addressing the root causes of forced marriage and other forms of conflict-related sexual violence. Some of the most important root causes for any form of sexual violence are gender inequality and patriarchal norms. Women and girls get forced into marriage because they live in societies where they are seen as a commodity or where marriage is seen as a protective measure against sexual immorality. We must work to tackle those norms that treat women as a second class gender. It is also important to look at all this holistically and along the humanitarian development and peace nexus. Forced marriage not only happens in conflict, it also happens before conflict and after conflict. And we must to continue to urge all governments to have laws and policies in place that prohibit forced and early marriage. And when we talk about forced marriage and armed conflict, it is important to also not lose sight of the overall goal to prevent conflict itself, which as the report points out, exacerbates forced marriage. Um, and because we know that women's security is one of the most important factors for the peacefulness of a state, working towards gender equality and tackling, tackling patriarchal norms not only helps to prevent forced marriage, but it also helps to prevent conflict as a whole. And yeah, I think I stop here. Thank you. And I look forward to the discussion. Thank you so much for that. Um, and next, we're going to turn to our panelist to my left on the far end, Victoria Nianjura. Victoria herself was abducted by the Lord's Resistance Army when she was 14 years old. After eight years in captivity, she returned home with her two children and is now the founder of Women in Action for Women and is also a founding member of the Leadership Council of the Global Survivor Network. Among other things, Victoria has played a significant role in organizing a petition for redress that resulted in the Parliament of Uganda unanimously passing a resolution to remedy the plight of victims of Northern Uganda's conflicts. Victoria, we wanna thank you so much for joining us today. And it's certainly a privilege for us to get to hear about your story and your work. So can you tell us a bit more about your experience working in Northern Uganda with survivors of forced marriage in the context of the LRA? Thank you, hi P. Hi. You and women for organizing this event. I also want to thank all the participants in the house and those online. Thank you so much. I thank you for giving me opportunity to also share my experience. 
before I can even go into talking about my experience working with the women, uh, we are talking about forced marriage, sexual slavery. I think it's important. I just say something briefly about myself as it is there. I want to say life can change in an instant. I was this young girl, I never thought I would one time be abducted or taken by the, thank you. I never thought I would be abducted, taken by the harmed group, but it happened and that's life. So the first 14 years of my life was really good with my family. Then it was on this fateful night that I was taken, eight years in captivity, having two children in captivity, then returning back home, it was real. Teddy tried eating certain things, the experiences of women back in Northern Uganda, and I want to confirm that it is real from a personal perspective, because the stigma, you can never run away from it. If even us or people who have never been abducted or lived fear to talk about the domestic violence that they suffer, what about this one that is open and it is known? So the suffering of the women back in Northern Uganda was real. Many suffered rejection, not because they wanted to, but families had various reasons for not receiving their children back home. One, you were living with the rebel commanders, so they didn't want to associate with you. Two, you returned with the children of the rebel commanders. Three, who is that person who will take care of you now that you already have that past experience? So the stigma, which automatically brings you into the trauma bit of it and so forth, I want to agree that 80% um, of women in Northern Uganda were abducted, have never been married. They try and it falls out, but uh, that's how life goes. So as we discuss this, it's important that we don't miss out on the stories, the silent stories of women or survivors of sexual violence, survivors of forced marriage who have suffered, uh, giving opportunity to maybe meet quite a number of this silent group or vulnerable group and listening to the unique stories will enable us to understand more how best we can um, address this. I am happy that a statement from UN Women says uh, it's important you address the root causes of this. We can only do it if we engage or involve the persons that have gone through or those who continue to go through by understanding why does this happen? How does it affect? How best do you think we can address some of this? And then uh, we design something that is crucial and that makes it uh, important because uh, uh, we all know that uh, involving persons who have suffered its key so in the finding, uh, I still UN Women says they're already working, they worked with survivor groups in uh, Nepal. I think that is a good thing, but I will also request everyone in here and those online that let's not limit it to specific context, but let's work with the survivors in each and every part of the world if we are to address some of this issue. The suffering is a very real one, Forced marriage, sexual violence is very deep and it has a lasting impact on an individual. If at all it can heal, I don't think it can heal. For me, I have specific things to say that uh, as some of these things happen, it's important we then get to know how best we can try to, to help others. For me, education, I must say, is the key. And my humble request is in the recommendations we make Let's have a holistic approach. You're interacting with the survivors. We are thinking of how best the policies can help to hold perpetrators accountable. But then even these women, the children, be able to get opportunity to go to the hospital. They should be able to go to school. The women should be able to do something that uh, enables them to meet the daily needs in their homes but also motivates them to continue participating in the different peace building activities. But uh, above all, when you have something, everyone will interact with you.
those who have never found space in the continue in the community continue to suffer. For me, I went back to school. At least I interact and I will have people. I have a good social network, but it's not the case for the many women. And uh, you will bear with me that when a woman is not happy, the same affects the children or the child. And if we don't address it now, then will we, when will we ever do? When these kids grow up in pain, it means even the children they give birth to will get affected automatically. So I really pray and say, as we include different experts where these discussions are made, let's try to make sure that the voices of survivors are not only listened from a distance. We are need to be tasked the different governments, the different NGO representatives to bring these survivors closer, let them participate from the actual development or designing of programs that work towards addressing the suffering that uh, we have suffered or many women back there are still suffering. It is real, certain things happen and you may never wish another person to, to go through. Thank you so much. I am happy to respond to any question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Victoria, and for being willing to share part of your story with us today and, and for reminding us that the response has to be holistic. It's not only a healthy response, but also educational, economic, social, psychosocial, and also the generational effects of this trauma that get passed down within the family. Um, and then, of course, the need to include survivors into the design of the programs and interventions. So thank you for those points. And, and hopefully we'll be, we will be able to come back to all of these in the Q&A. So just before I turn to our last speaker, I want to remind you that after this, we'll be taking interventions, comments, questions, both from the, the in-room participants, but also online. So for those of us joining on Zoom, you can use the uh, the raise hand button, I believe, or the, the question button on the on the Zoom link if you'd like to ask a question to our panelists. So finally, now I'm, I'm very pleased to turn uh, to my immediate left to Alejandra Sanchez, who works in the office of the SRSG on sexual violence and conflict, where he has been the co-pen holder of the last four annual uh, reports of the Secretary General on conflict related to sexual violence. Prior to this, Alejandro worked with UN Women at both headquarters and in Colombia, and he was also a women's protection advisor in MONUSCO in the DRC, leading on investigations on sexual violence in conflict areas. So Alejandro, turning to you now, how does the work of the Office of the SRSG on Sexual Violence and Conflict help to prevent and address forced marriage and other forms of CRSV? Thanks. Thank you so much, Jenna. And uh, let me start by thanking IPI and UN Women for organizing this important event and uh, congratulate the authors of this piece, Phoebe and, and, and Emily, for the findings of the research. Um, <clears throat> let me start by saying that CRSV remains on our daily headlines. It continues to be used as a, as a tactic of terror and war against civilians. Uh, instances of forced marriage uh, make part of the repertoire of violence used by parties to the conflict against civilians, particularly affecting women and girls. As a matter of fact, Forced marriage is explicitly mentioned in the UN definition of CRSD that is included in the annual report of the Secretary General uh, on this topic, along with other forms of sexual violence, such as rape, sexual slavery, forced prostitution, forced pregnancy, amongst others. Since the inception, uh, since it is inception, uh, inception, the office where I work has analyzed and reported annually on the political security and socioeconomic dimensions of, of this court. The past 13 annual reports on CRSD submitted to the Security Council have documented patterns of and trends related to forced marriage. The 14th report is currently being prepared and will be presented to the Security Council later in the year. As every other form of CRSD, forced marriage does not occur in a vacuum, but is tied to broader security dynamics, such as the resurgence of hostilities, rising militarization, extremism, arms proliferation, displacement, or the collapse, uh, the collapse rule of law. Uh, 
uh, allow me to share a couple of trends documented and reported over the years related to forced marriage in the frame of these reports. These examples are, of course, non-exhaustive and do not pretend to present a full picture of the situation, just to share this with you some of the, of the, of, of the findings that, uh, that have been reported over the years. Um, in the very first report presented to the Security Council in 2009, patterns of forced marriage were already being documented. For instance, such that report noted that in the DRC, elements of FDLR and Mai Mai abducted women and girls who were then assigned to soldier as a wife. Other groups, as the ADF and the National Army for the Liberation of Uganda, also carried out patterns of forced marriage, sometimes of girls as young as 12. Since then, cases and patterns of forced marriages have, have continued to be reported systematically to the Security Council every year. Forced marriage has also been a chronic feature of the political economy of war, in which women and girls have been forced to marry combatants of non-state armed groups as a reward for fighters and an incentive for new recruits. This pattern has been documented over the years in Somalia, Syria, Yemen, among other countries. Reports also indicate that forced marriage to, to foreign fighters was common in territories controlled by ISIL. Forced marriage also takes place in contexts in which rule of law has collapsed due to protracted conflict and instability. For instance, reports of survivors being coerced into marriage with either the perpetrator or the perpetrator's family members have been documented. It is clear that compelling survivors to marry their attackers revictimizes them, resulting in impunity for the perpetrators and sends the message that sexual violence is, is socially acceptable. For, for example, in South Sudan, the weakness of the justice systems has contributed to a reliance on traditional mechanisms, which generally do not treat rape as a crime under which forced marriage is routinely prescribed as a remedy. Forced marriage, as, uh, as Victoria was saying, is also a factor that exacerbates stigma. A survivor of forced marriage may, may be branded as a soldier's wife when chased from her home to, to, to face a future indigence and social, and social exclusion for herself and often her children. Many women lose their health, livelihoods, husbands, families, support networks as a result of CRSV, including forced marriage. There is also a close link between abductions and forced marriage, as, as, as TB was mentioning, while bearing in mind that these are distinct violations. Abductions exponentially heighten the risk for civilians, particularly women and girls, to be subjected to different forms of sexual violence. For instance, in 2012, the abduction of women as a way to acquire a wife with, uh, without paying a bright price was documented as a trigger for violence in Jungli State in South Sudan. Uh, forced marriage, as any other form of, of CRSV, remains chronically underreported, owing to social stigma, uh, shame, fear of reprisals, among others. In terms of response, let me just provide some background information and, and give a, a, a few pointers because I know the time is, 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 is ticking, the clock is ticking. <laughs> the, mind of, the mandate of the office was established by resolution 1888 in 2009. Uh, uh, today, the concept of CRSV as a war crime, a crime against the community, against humanity, and, and a constituent act of genocide, which cannot be amnestied in the context of peace negotiation of tra or transitional justice processes, has gained widespread acceptance. CRSV no longer dismissed as a collateral damage, but rather recognized as a grave crime that is preventable and punishable under international law. In terms of specific progresses since the inception of the mandate, the first thing is, uh, is this enhanced recognition of CRSV as a self-standing threat to collective security and an, an, an impediment to, to the restoration of, of peace that has been reflected in a series of Security Council resolutions from, from, from 2008 to, to 2019 by Resolution 2467, which requires CRSV to be treated as a security issue that demands operational security, justice, and service, and, and server, service delivery responses. Um, I can also talk about the establishment, about the monitoring, analysis, and reporting arrangements of CRSD in the field that have deepened the quality and quantity of evidence available uh, to inform the policy and, prog and programmatic response and the integration of early warning indicators of CRSD into existing prevention and protection systems in conflict-affected settings. Uh, the office has also engaged with state and non-state actors in order to adopt uh, political and protection commitments to address sexual violence. In some of the cases, uh, the office has signed unilateral commitments with non-state actors to prevent and address CRSV in contexts such as the Central African Republic, Mali, and South Sudan. Um, there is also the deployment of women protection advisors to UN peace operations that, that convene these monitoring uh, and reporting arrangements, engage with all concerned parties and institutional counterparts, and support the implementation of these political commitments. Um, 
Um, also, also uh, as I was mentioned in, in, in the report, as, as well, this is the integration of sexual violence as, as a standalone criteria in the, in, in, in the mandates of relevant sanctions regimes as part of the efforts to enforce compliance and, and affect behavioral change. Um, let me just, just close providing three very concrete recommendations. The first thing is that, let's say, we need to enhance the efforts on prevention of all forms of CRSV, including, including forced marriage. We must, we must shift from this reactive mode in which, uh, in, in which say, we're responding to these atrocities once they have happened to, to a more preventive mode in which all political, diplomatic, and enforcement tools are used to compel parties to respect international law. And this includes leveraging, leveraging the credible threat of sanctions, as well as consistent and visible accountability measures, which signal to perpetrators that sexual violence will not go unpunished. The second one is closing the gap between political commitments made at the global level and the need for increased concrete action, technical capacity, and financial resources to address sexual violence in conflict areas and its consequences in consequences of survivors. And lastly, um, it is important to ensure comprehensive and multi-sectoral care. It must include life-saving medical care, sexual and reproductive health services, psychosocial and socioeconomic reintegration support, and access to justice. We must also empower women organizations and politically active women, uh, including those working on the front lines to address CRSB and protect them from any form of reprisal. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Alejandro. And, and we've heard a lot about monitoring and reporting today, and, and certainly, you know, your office and the, and the work that you're doing every year in reporting on specific cases has indeed had an impact in some cases in terms of holding people accountable and, and reducing the number of cases in some contexts. So thank you so much for that. Before we open the q and I did want to give Teddy one more chance to come back in if she would like. So Teddy, I don't know if you're with us, if you had anything else that you wanted to add to your intervention. I'm not sure if Teddy is with us. No, she's not? Okay. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, okay, so I'm very happy to open the floor now to folks in the room uh, and as well as to our online if you want to use the Q&A function. Um, I myself already have a full list of questions I'm interested in asking, so I will jump in as well if needed, but I want to, of course, open the floor. Just raise your hand if you have anything that you'd like to ask or comment on. Yes. Thank you. We have a mic that we will pass around. So if you don't mind just standing and briefly introducing yourself. Sure. Hi, my name is Catherine Poulton. I'm the global lead on gender-based violence and emergencies for UNICEF. Firstly, I just thank you. Thank you also for a short report. That's always nice. I've already been able to leaf through it quite quickly, as opposed to, you know, 70 pages that I never read. So thank you very much for that. Thank you also for using existing data sets. Really appreciate that instead of going out to the field asking women intrusive questions. A couple of reflections. One is the most underfunded sector in the humanitarian world is GBV, and yet we are the frontline responders to forced marriage. So I'm surprised that one of your recommendations is not about funding service delivery and frontline service delivery, especially women like Victoria and Teddy who are doing, providing those life-saving services. So, you know, just curiosity about that. And then the second comment is around data and data collection. You know, there's a lot of obsession around data collection and there's a huge amount of bad practice that is harmful. So I see in the actual recommendation, there's a lot of framing around safety and safeguards, but really encouraging a risk benefit analysis to any kind of data collection. You know, for years we've been pushing back against global databases and data collection on these things because they're not associated to service delivery. They're not associated to action on the ground that will actually support women and girls. So just to caution the data collection piece, because, you know, as a practitioner for over 20 years, I'm still fighting that battle. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. We'll take a couple of interventions and then we'll allow the panelists. Yes, up here in the front. Of survival is also tracking the circle itself. So I'm very interested at your children, survival children. What is how are their lives in this like? Are they able to register and get official? Oh, it's not working. Okay. <laughs> Are they able to register and get official document? Like I know in the Middle East, it's very hard 
uh, for su mother survival to register just as a single parent. This is one thing. And the second part, uh, have you ever seen the, the psychic going back for the children and being abducted again and male going as uh, children soldiers and females going back as a children bridal at these uh, arm, was, was arm groups? Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, we can take one more if anybody else. Okay, and I'll maybe throw one more on the floor just to make it three. Um, you know, we talk a lot about disaggregating different forms of violence within conflict. Um, and I know part of what the authors are, are recommending in the report is the importance of separating um, forced marriage from both sexual slavery as well as other forms of CRSV. And this could go to, to multiple of our panelists, but can you talk a little bit about why it's important to treat forced marriage as a distinct form of CRSV, both in terms of the monitoring and reporting that's being done, but also um, in the response. So putting that on the floor, I think maybe first we can turn um, to Phoebe and Emily to comment on the question about the recommendations on funding. Um, and then maybe um, Alejandro, I don't, maybe you would wanna talk a bit about the, the point made about the, the safety and security of survivors when it comes to to data collection, and then we'll turn to Victoria for the question about children. So Phoebe and Emily, over to you. Thank you, Jenna, and thank you, Catherine, for the question um, about the why there wasn't a recommendation to fund frontline service delivery was to keep the report short. <laughs> so we had a long list of recommendations that our dear editor helped us kind of condense and make sure they really fed out of the report. But I just want to reaffirm and reiterate the importance of funding frontline service delivery organizations like Victoria. I mentioned another one I worked with in Uganda in the report, Juan. Um, and so there are several organizations that we want to highlight and encourage funding for that. And then for your second part of the question, just to briefly address what our recommendations were hoping for is not to do renewed data collection, but instead to try to add detail in existing data collection so that CRSV doesn't become this kind of general catch-all, but we can really understand the patterns by data we're already getting. So I will maybe, I could turn to Emily to talk about sexual slavery and forced marriage and the distinctions we made. Sure, yeah. So one of the reasons that we felt that it was important to treat forced marriage as a distinct form of sexual violence um, is precisely because we think in order to prevent and respond to phenomenon, you really have to understand what's happening. Um, so just to illustrate, one of the things that we noticed when we were looking at um, people who are targeted for sexual slavery versus forced marriage is that they often do target different populations. So uh, sexual slavery usually is civilian women being abducted by armed group members. Um, and forced marriage can occur that way, but it can also be, um, as Phoebe mentioned when she discussed Al-Shabaab, it can be women who are living in a community that's governed by an armed group being forced into that marriage and their entire family is then tied to that armed group and lives under armed group authority. And that's quite a different experience. Um, we also noticed that within arm groups, they might target different populations for each form of sexual violence. So for example, um, ISIL tends to target Yazidi women for sexual slavery, and then women that they govern um, for forced marriage. Um, forced marriage can also happen to women who are voluntarily in the armed group in the case of member member forced marriage. Um, so this variation is just to highlight that if we don't understand how these patterns diverge and how they influence who is targeted and how they're targeted, it's much more difficult to prevent it and to design um, victim-centered responses. Uh, and then even when forced marriage looks like sexual slavery in the sense that um, it's abduction, calling it sexual slavery when the person has been forced into a marriage and really forms like a conjugal partnership with this person is is not capturing what their experience was. Um, so those are the some of the reasons that we felt it was important to treat it. Thank you for that, Emily. Um, Alejandro, I'll turn to you next. And I think the point about data collection is a really good one. And 
something that many parts of the UN system are grappling with right now because there is such an increased focus on data collection um, and sometimes a, a sense that just more data is better always, but without always thinking about um, the challenges and sometimes the risks that that poses to individuals. Um, so I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about um, maybe specifically your office, but then just some of the lessons that you've learned in general about how you uh, balance the need for data and specific data, but then also keeping the best interests of individuals at the center of that um, and how you think about that in your work. Thank you, Jenna. Um, thank you. Um, let me start by 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 perhaps uh, and just just putting one thing clear. Let's say the information that is reported in the in the frame of the of the report of the Secretary General on CRSV. Uh, those numbers do not intend to 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 paint a full picture about the prevalence of CRSV around the world because because measuring the prevalence is just is just not possible and perhaps it's not even necessary it's not even necessary because let's say one case is too much and uh, and uh, and uh, and it's very likely that uh, that where there are where there are active uh, active hostilities that sexual violence is, is very likely happening um um the data that is that is reported that is reported in the frame of this report uh, is uh, is uh, is, from, is from investigations carried out at uh, at 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 the field level so, so let's say the idea once again let's say this will not show the full picture but it will mainly it will mainly let's say just try to draw let's say like a like a, like a sort of overall trend about about what is happening and uh, and i have seen this sentence before uh, uh, I've seen it before, but but in terms of the of of, of documentation of, of sexual violence, the documentation of today is the prosecution of tomorrow. So 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 uh, let's say all of this information is important, and uh, and 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 this information will let's say could be later and be used in 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 in, in judicial processes and, uh, and and other settings. So let's say just just in short, just to say that uh, that uh, well well I know that that. Uh, there is not not a common position against or 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 or, or pro the data collection by the UN. Let's say this this information remains, however, very critical in 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 certain processes. In terms of safety and and security, I I I can say let's say our office doesn't really collect information directly. Let's say we do let's say in partnership. Let's say with our let's say with the UN entities in the ground. But normally, they say the 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 survivors that that uh, the data that is that is collected. Uh, for the report, let's say it's is done. Let's say following uh, basic principles of, of confidentiality, security, and safety. Thank you. Thanks for that. And and maybe too, we can get the a bit of a UN Women perspective on this because, of course, undertaking survivor-centered approaches is really key to UN Women's work, and, and of course, the UN more broadly. But but if you have anything that you wanted to weigh in on this point. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, I mentioned earlier in my remarks our program, our partnership we have with Justice Rapid Response and OHCHR to deploy dedicated SGVV investigators and interpreters. So these are experts who have experience, who have who come there with a with a mindset, who have who, who are trained to to do these kinds of investigations. Um, the same for having specialized interpreters. So this is this is one way um, to well to to increase the quality of reporting, but also to what what, what is in the report, but also really how um, yeah how the engagement with uh, survivors um, is done. Thank you so much for that. Um, Victoria, I'd like to turn to you next. We had a, a couple of questions around um, children and the return of children. Uh, I believe the question was on their ability to receive documentation and also maybe perhaps heightened risk of further abduction. So if you have any comment on that. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, with registration, you always have to provide maybe where you gave birth, details of the father of the child and so forth, which most of us do not know. First of all, in captivity, it was survival. People didn't use their real names. Others had to change, so their identity is not traced. Maybe for reasons like protecting their people who had remained home, but some of us who were abducted from school, we couldn't hide away from that, the names. We had to maintain the names that we used home and so forth. 
So in response to registration, it has been a challenge uh, when Uganda started registering the citizens to have national ID identification. But uh, as you heard in 2014, when we presented the petition request for a special consideration to register these children was in our petition. And as I speak now, it's a discussion that is still ongoing there is positivity that these children will be made to register without seeking specific uh, information that we can't provide. So most of these kids have not yet been registered. In line of uh, whether other people are going back into captivity and so forth, the LRA war was a unique one. It started in Uganda, went to Sudan, Southern Sudan, Democratic Republic of Congo, as we speak, at least they ended in Central African Republic of Congo. So those who returned, the male easily got absorbed into the government army. So they are employed, they're handing something. The women, it's hard. So women had their children, you don't have where to leave them. That's why the challenge, the impact of the war is more felt on the women. These children have grown. By then others, we are three years now. These are kids who are 20, 23. We have those of 25. The youngest could be around 16. So the challenge is uh, or something that I can put forward is as we tackle addressing violence, conflict, and so forth, we shouldn't make it the immediate solution. Let's uh, always look at the long-term effect because the war in Northern Uganda is no longer talked much about, yet the impact is real now. So thank you. Thank you for that. Um, we can take some more interventions from the room and I also have a couple of questions online. Um, we have a question from Christine Gibson, uh, who asks, how often has the IFRC been the group to intercede in the field to bring the women and girls in situations of gender-based violence and forced marriage to safe havens? I believe maybe that's the Red Cross. Uh, and how many of these armed groups and non-state actors have been successfully brought before the ICRC and ICC for prosecution and have won these cases. Uh, so I'm not sure if we would have exact figures on the panel, but um, Alejandro, maybe you could speak a bit to accountability, maybe from reporting, um, but from the field perspective, um, if any of our panelists would want to talk a little bit about groups like the Red Cross, and, and maybe if I could add on to that question, the way that it's posed a bit, just to think about, what are some examples of how international actors, whether it's the UN, um, ICRC, et cetera, how, how they can best um, coordinate with and support local actors on the ground as we're talking about this type of a holistic response. Um, obviously local groups who are embedded within communities who really understand um, the people that they're working with are best situated in order to understand the context. So how is it that international actors um, can best partner alongside of them and support them. Um, so I don't know if anyone on the panel has a, an answer on the accountability portion of the question. I mean, I'm, I'm looking to Pauline to share more about this, but there's a, a conference going on right now about how the International Criminal Court has prosecuted forced marriage as a crime against humanity. And it's specifically one of the, the first ruling of forced marriage as a crime against humanity was at the ICC for Dominique Ongwen, who is a commander in the LRA. So um, I don't know, Victoria is speaking at that, that conference and Pauline I know has background in this, um, but that is kind of setting the precedent hopefully for more prosecutions along those lines in international criminal courts. Yeah, just uh, just to just to add to that, uh, the Ongwen case, which is really the first time that the International Criminal Court has um, has confirmed that forced marriage constitutes a crime against humanity. It's um, it confirmed that it is another inhumane act um, within the framework of a crime against humanity, and that um, was confirmed by the appeals chamber. So yeah, that is a that is a confirmed confirmed ruling. 
Um, yeah, and you, you mentioned the, the, the conference happening the next, uh, the next two days, um, which we with um, yeah, a lot of other organizations um, are contributing to. And uh, yeah, that focuses specifically on, on the Ongwen case and um, on feminist lawyering um, around, around um, that, that case. Anything to add on the accountability piece? Um, just very short. No, um, perhaps, perhaps I don't have a specific example for, for forced marriage, but as I was mentioning uh, on my intervention, let's say like this, this, this shaped into into in the understanding of of, of CRSB in the last few years has also has also in, 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 entailed some changes in 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 terms of accountability or prosecution. So, for example, now sexual violence ha has become increasingly uh, an integral part of criminal investigations, and uh, and 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 for example, in different countries, mobile courts and military and military tribunals have effectively prosecuted perpetrators of sexual violence including within 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 state forces so so i mean let's say this this major understanding about about all forms of sexual violence has has also had an, uh, a positive impact on on on, on accountability it's still still say, a lot remains to be done mm -hmm. victoria if i can turn to you maybe to talk a bit about how the international community can best come alongside and support um, some of the, the local efforts that are being done and as part of this holistic response. Maybe if you have any recommendations around this, if you have any examples you could share with us. Thank you. So to me, the international actors are already on the ground. The gap that exists is not being able to reach that uh, the small grassroots groups like we have the community base. And this comes with certain things. Every time we have tried it, sometimes you should have spent some specific amount of money for you to qualify to apply for a grant. You should be having the requirement for you to really apply and get the things is what affects the grassroots uh, initiatives from benefiting from uh, grants that sometimes international actors have at the broader level. So my simple recommendation is for us to sit here and realize that we are not going to do much if we leave out the people who understand what affects them, the people who know what can be done, the people who continue to interact with the situation on the ground and think uh, being at a distance will help. I also understand the kind of uh, challenge that exists. Maybe there is a national NGO, but sometimes there are those that stay at the city level. They are not about to go there. They are very good at writing reports and so forth. Then the small initiatives that could do more may not have the capacity to, to give this report, to write the proposal in a way that would be required. So as I said earlier, for me, it's just rethinking. If you're going to like work, you want to address issues in Northern Uganda, task the immediate uh, partner organization you're working with to identify the small initiatives in those community. So it is a partnership. You can partner with the uh, national NGO, but they should be able to provide small grants to the initiatives so we can work. Uh, initiatives like mine are over eight, but we don't, we participate at our own level. We don't get to offer that very much like we would have loved to do because we are not yet there to be able to access this. But I know it's doable if we all commit ourselves to that. Thank you. Thank you for that. Any other interventions from the floor? We're from our online space. Yes. Hi, um, thank you all so much. My name is Gretchen Baldwin. I'm a researcher at the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute. Um, I'm wondering whether with regards to forced marriage, um, and this is maybe primarily for Phoebe and Emily, but I'd love to hear from anyone. Um, wondering whether with regards to forced marriage, you see much data in these sets that might disrupt the usual binary assumptions about CRSV um, or conflict related human rights violations, perhaps more generally. Um, so for example, I mean, I know from the Northern Uganda case, at least, 
Um, you know, one sort of disruption area is that often only boys are understood as child soldiers, but we know that there have been many instances of young girls also being recruited as child soldiers. And my understanding is there have been then issues with reintegration, disarmament for both girls and women not being um, recognized as, as former combatants um, and, and sort of not getting the resources then that they need. So are there instances in the data sets that you're looking at or in your own experiences you know, on the ground um, of boys or men being forced into marriage, um, being victims of forced marriage rather, um, you know, assuming, and, and assuming that it does happen sometimes and assuming that as with all instances of CRSV, it is underreported, um, you know, do you see avenues for maybe better addressing that issue? Sorry, that's a little rambly, but I hope it makes sense. Thanks, Gretchen. And we have another one up here in the front as well. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Maria Salib. I work at, uh, I'm a part of the CRSP team at DPO. Um, I used to work with the United Nations Mission in South Sudan before this, and I want to wear that hat and uh, talk a little bit about the things that have been discussed, especially in terms of uh, what the international community can do. Um, and taking on from what Victoria said, maybe just sharing a little good practice that we had uh, back when I was the Women Protection Advisor um, at UNMIS. Um, so we partnered, um, uh, I mean, we, we, we managed to secure some funding and then we partnered, like uh, Victoria said, with a local civil society organization in Western Equatoria State and with about, uh, worked with about 200 former abductees, some of which had uh, faced forced marriage, uh, many of them had uh, children born out of rape. And uh, one of the basic things that we followed, of course, was a survivor-centered approach, do no harm, whether it was collecting data or not collecting data in a certain way and using what was available. Um, one of the very important things that uh, the project seeked to um, focus on was also, apart from, of course, the psychosocial counseling and working with children born out of rape, was also economic empowerment. So an important part of the project was to make sure how these women are not forced to go back to their abductors because they have nowhere better to go because of the stigmatization uh, and all the other factors. So a part of the project was to make sure that they are given a small amount of money after having been trained in some sort of a livelihood skill so that they're able to be reintegrated into the community. So that's one good practice uh, uh, that was done, but it was obviously done in partnership with the local uh, civil society organi organizations. So yeah, that was just a small practice I wanted to share. Thank you so much for sharing that. Any other interventions? Otherwise, maybe I'll turn first to Phoebe and Emily to address Gretchen's question on potential binary assumptions that you found in the data set, and then Alejandro, maybe as well, you can speak. I know that the, the annual report of the Secretary General also really is intentional about discussing different forms of CRSV that are affecting men and boys as well. So then maybe you can talk on that as well. Thanks, Gretchen. Yeah, it's a good question. And I think with forced marriage, it really disrupts kind of the clear binaries of victim perpetrator in a way that's quite confusing for many of us to kind of grasp and get a handle on. And I think in the academic space, there's been some good thinking around this. So Aaron Baines's work has looked at kind of how forced marriages have changed boys and men's relationships and identities. Um, and so, yeah, I think we are careful in the report to say that there's, there's not, we're not saying there are no instances in which men and boys can be victims, and we mostly have a, more data on women and girls as victims of forced marriage. And in certain cases, this is because some of the power dynamics in armed groups. Um, but I think by looking at the forms of forced marriage, it gives more room for different understandings of it. So in terms of kind of not, you know, we call them a genocidal regime, but the Khmer Rouge used forced marriage against women, men, boys, girls. And that was kind of that civilian, civilian forced marriage. So I think by broadening our understanding of what forced marriage can look like, it'll allow us to disrupt some of those binaries. Um, I'll just add on to that as well. Uh, Phoebe, I was also gonna mention the um, Aaron Baines and Omer Ajazi article. Um, but yeah, we say, we focus on mostly women victims because they do make up most of the victims, but we certainly do see evidence of um, men and boys being 
victims of forced marriage. And as Phoebe was mentioning, understanding these different forms forced marriage can take is really helpful in identifying when that happens. So in addition to the civilian-civilian forced marriage that um, Phoebe mentioned, I think we also see it in member-member forced marriage, um, where uh, you're, you're a part of the armed group and you're expected by people who are ranking above you to enter into these revolutionary marriages or other sorts of forced marriages with another armed group member. And frequently that is a high, higher ranking man and a lower ranking woman, but it can also happen to lower ranking men and boys. Um, another area where we see this binary disrupted is in the case of forced recruitment. So how do you classify um, a forced marriage between a man who has been forced into an armed group and a civilian woman, for example. Um, and so I think that just hammers home how these cycles of violence are really interconnected. Um, and as Phoebe said, how the lines of victim and perpetrator can be quite blurred within armed groups when it comes to forced marriage. Thank you. Um, in regards to... Um, the issue of the data uh, that you were mentioning from our perspective. Um, the report tries to uh, uh, make sure that the issue of intersectionality is, is, is clearly is clearly included, included on, on every submission, more or less like recognizing that survivors are not an homogeneous group and, and that and the different factors uh, make make let's say, the understanding of, of, of specific cases different. And uh, and and of course the the report documents cases, trends, and patterns of sexual violence against men and boys, and and also and also against against LGBTQI uh, people. Let's say perhaps let's say what I can say is, is that normally normally most of the cases documented against men and boys are uh, are those that happen in in detention settings. But but perhaps another important thing in this regard is is is, is that I said this is a Security Council mandated report and 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 the resolutions on sexual violence are part of the wider women peace and security agenda. So so I said, the report has a strong feminist background and uh, and uh, and we could not underline more that that even though let's say cases are are, are documented against men and boys and LGBT, LGBTQI people, uh, these disproportionately affect women and girls. And more or less, let's say our estimation says the more this of the documented cases is the affectation of women and girls is around 95 percent so even though we need to have let's say like a broad a broad side about this we'll also let's say uh, cannot stop underlining that that this affects mainly women women and girls and response prevention response strategies need to also have an important orientation on this thank you Thank you. I want to go back um, to Pauline's earlier comment about addressing root causes. And, and certainly, if you study, I think, any form of, of CRSV and gender-based violence, we understand that it is rooted in some of the, uh, the structures of the culture and, and, and masculine identities and, and um, uh, the patriarchal assumptions and, and practices within a culture. So my question is, you know, when we're thinking about conflict related violence in particular, um, to what extent is there a risk that the responses to conflict related sexual violence become overly securitized, thinking about security responses to them. Um, and while there may be a need in some settings, and I'm hypothesizing here to have some sort of perhaps security type of response in emergency and crisis settings, does that in some cases exacerbate these norms? Um, and how can international actors actually play a role in helping to address some of these deeply rooted societal practices that really create the culture in which these types of violence can flourish? I don't have a specific person I'm addressing that to, so anyone, please feel free to jump in. I mean, I think First, it made me think about the international community needs to also address what's going on in internally in its own house. So in order to think about kind of combating conflict related sexual violence, it's also really important to think about militarized violence occurring within organizations that are responding. So I just wanted to put that out there as we're thinking about, you know, what the international community can do to also shed a light on some of the environments and context and patterns of abuse that are occurring internally and how that can be kind of a first step showing accountability and prevention in 
aid organizations and military organizations that are responding as a really positive first step in attempting to look at this external form. Um, yes, yeah, so, so two things. Um, on the one hand, when we look at the security sector, there's we can we should we also need to work that there are more women represented in the security sector, um, which which is an which is an important point. But then also shifting shifting to civil society, and I just because it has been highlighted before, but can be highlighted often enough um, how important it is to support and fund local women's organizations who are so underfunded, who do incredibly important work. And um, Victoria also highlighted some, some of the challenges to access this funding. And that's something where we all need to find solution to really make sure that the, the really local organizations are able to access this funding. But it is also important that such funding to women's organizations, to survivor organizations, that it is flexible and that it is also long-term and not only focused on a specific, um, a specific, specific project. But I think when, when these organizations would, would be funded in a way that um, is necessary, then they could also take on a lot of, a lot of the work that it is currently mm -hmm. taken on by more securitized actors. Mm -hmm. So maybe if I can, just a final question. As, as I mentioned in the opening, you know, the sixth committee has been debating this week on uh, the potential new treaty on crimes against humanity and what that will look like. And, and one of the points that I believe you make in the report, Phoebe and Emily, is, is the importance and kind of timeliness of including forced marriage as a distinct form of CRSV within this treaty. So can you just tell us, perhaps in closing, um, why does that matter? Why, you know, not only why does having the specific treaty on crimes against humanity matter, but why does having uh, a distinct form of CRSV like forced marriage listed specifically within the treaty? Why is that important? Emily, do you want to start and then I can conclude? Sure. Yeah. So um, I think as I was, this kind of links back to my answer on um, the difference between sexual slavery and, and forced marriage and why that's important. I think if something doesn't get recognized, um, then it's less likely that we'll like fully interrogate why it's happening, how to respond and how to prevent it. Um, and so I think that we have this timely opportunity to recognize it at a, on a very large stage um, and hopefully lift up voices of survivors um, and just make sure that we're doing what we can to fully understand this phenomenon that has affected so many women and, and men and boys, as we talked about in the last answer. Thank you. Yeah, to build off of that, I mean, we've, as Alejandro was mentioning, we've gone, we're moved past the point of recognizing conflict related sexual violence as a phenomenon that's occurring. And so I think by recognizing different forms, we're pushing that further. We're now at the next stage where we're saying, okay, yes, we, we know this catch-all conflict-related sexual violence, but now we need to understand what is actually happening on the ground. What kind of forms, how is this affecting people? And by being really explicit, especially in international law and legal frameworks, it's really getting at not all sexual violence looks the same, not all sexual violence is wartime rape, Forced marriage is actually one form that's quite easy to hide. So we heard, I think Alejandro mentioned, laws about marrying your rapist. So there's a possibility, you know, where there's wartime rape and then it's disguised through forced marriage. So I think it's a complex crime. And then as Victoria has mentioned, and hopefully we'll talk more about in her concluding is it's really long lasting and generational and cycles of violence. And this isn't to say that other forms of CRSV aren't that, but I think we really need to highlight just how deep it can, the tentacles of forced marriage reach. These are lineages, these are children. And so it's, it's an opportunity to really think beyond, you know, just a current conflict phase and to think about what people's lives look like and how they're transformed in the very long term, decades after, if not longer.
Thank you for that. And so now just to wrap up, I wanted to give each member of our panel maybe just one minute each. Um, and Victoria, I'd like to start with you if I can. Um, we're really honored to have you with us today. Maybe you know one or two quick things that you identify as, as real priorities um, for policymakers moving forward. Thank you so much once again, and thank you all for listening. I will still emphasize that uh, it's going to be important for us to involve survivors at all levels of the work we do, if something good is to happen. And we, that society must seek, we should know it's a responsibility, and must seek to understand the survivors the challenges in the communities we work, and then give those people the opportunity to advocate and address these issues. Uh, to international bodies, please work as a team. Partner and make sure you work towards addressing real issues on ground. Thank you. Thank you so much. Alejandro, any last words from you in terms of next step priorities? Thank you, Jenna. No, I, I think I think uh, only one pointer that that was also included included in the in the piece in the piece drafted by by Phoebe and Emily is is, is perhaps the, the 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 need for increased uh, increased capacity within within um, panels of experts of of, of sexual regimes on in, in 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 terms of monitoring and investigation of uh, of sexual violence. Let's say this has been a gap that uh, that has been identified for quite some time now. It has been consistently recommended in in the frame of the and all reports of the Secretary General, but still, let's say right now, uh, Rana, let's say, I think the panels uh, of experts do a fantastic work with very, with very limited uh, resources. So, 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 I th uh, let's say, we do believe that uh, that uh, let's say this could be something that they could enhance, like a major, major understanding and and and, and, and major and, and and a better monitoring of of different patterns of sexual violence, including forced marriage, of course. Thank you so much, Pauline. Thanks. I can I can just echo what Victoria said, like really this importance of a survivor-centered approach of really not only working with survivors or for survivors, but really creating creating an environment where where they can lead and shape the policy and um, the programming we are doing. Thank you so much. I'm actually going to skip Phoebe and jump to Emily and give Phoebe the last word here today. Emily, over to you. Sure. Well, just to say, first of all, thank you for all of the questions and to the other panelists. Um, this was a really exciting discussion. Um, I hope that, I guess, in concluding, I hope that our report can be a, a tool to start to think about um, some of these issues, both the ones that we raised and the ones that we maybe had less time to emphasize. Um, and I also just want to echo that um, our report highlights the various ways that forced marriage can impact people's lives. And so I, I am hopeful that it will help um, identify survivors um, and give them a voice as well. Thanks, Emily. And finally to you, Phoebe, as head of our WPS program at IPI, and also as a scholar who's been studying forced marriage for quite a few years now, um, where do you see this going next and what are your priorities? Yeah, I mean, moving to the, to the academic priorities and thinking a next step, I'm hoping that this as a report is just starting the conversation. And I think one thing that's kind of absent from the report um, is why. Why do certain groups use forced marriage? Why do certain groups use some forms of forced marriage? So at least for Emily and I, I think our next step in thinking is going to try to understand this strategy with the goal that if we understand why groups use it, we can prevent it. So I will conclude there and also just want to recognize Victoria and all of the survivors of forced marriage. I've spoken to some of them in Northern Uganda. And as Victoria mentioned, there's wonderful organizations there doing work in this space. And that's just one context. So encouraging everyone to kind of look to see what other organizations are doing in spaces in support of survivors of forced marriage. Thank you so much.
Thanks, Phoebe, and thanks to everyone for coming. We want to thank again all of our panelists for being here. Um, please do check out the report, which you can pick up in the lobby on your way out or look at online. Um, and thank you very much to our partners, to Folk Bernadette Academy, as well as to UN Women for partnering with us today. And thank you to all of you for being here. Have a great afternoon. <laughs>